computer. Boom. All right, again, one last time. We have Brendan Salwa with us today for the Sharks for Kids webinar series. He's going to be talking to us about uh, oceanic sharks as well as the ecosystem that they live in and some of the other work that he's been doing with the Cape Luther Institute and the Island School and the Oceanic White Tip Collaborative um, over the years. All right, I'll leave it with you and then I'll be hiding in the background if you have any problems. All right, bud. Awesome, thanks, Duncan. Um, I guess first thing, I, I'd be happy to talk about silkies or oceanics a little bit, um, but actually the presentation I have is, is about studying sharks using grubs. Um, so hopefully that is still of interest to folks. Um, but we can certainly talk about some of these other things afterwards. Um, yeah, definitely. So, oh, sorry about that. Yeah, sorry about that. I, uh, I joined the party in the last time, but yeah, definitely uh, please keep going with the brubs. That's fantastic. Thanks, Brandon. Cool. Um, so let's see. All right, so yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna be talking about brubs to study how we use brubs to study sharks in the sound and some of the cool data that we've gathered from them. Um, a lot of this work, really, what I'm presenting is work that's been done by a number of folks here in Cape Luther at the Cape Luther Institute and Island School. Um, I've been doing some work using brubs in the past couple of years down deep, and so we'll end on on some of that. Um, so thanks for being here again. My name is Brendan Tallar. I'm a PhD student at FIU in Miami. You can see that on the left-hand side of the screen there um, on the kind of southeast coast of Florida. And if you take a flight almost directly east, you'll hit New Providence. Um, hopefully you guys can see that there. And then down here is where we work. You can see the island of Eleuthera, um, quite long. It's, it's a very narrow but, but long island. And we live down south, a place called Cape Eleuthera. That little, that little area that's highlighted with the red dot. Um, and so it's a really amazing place to work. We have access to a number of really amazing ecosystems from shallow mangrove creeks that are tidal. We've got all these tidal flats with bonefish and, and small lemon sharks and things. Moving out to coral reefs and seagrass beds and big sand banks that you can see there to the top of your screen. And then if you move a little bit to the west, you hit deep water where you go from, you know, around 100 feet deep to down to 300 meters almost instantly. There's a near vertical cliff face there. And then it slopes out to over 1,000 meters quite rapidly. Um, so it's a great place to work because we have access to all of these different ecosystems within about a 15-minute boat ride from our home base. On top of that, we're obviously in the Bahamas, which is a great place to research sharks because there are plenty of them for us to study. And that's largely due to a long history of um, really forward thinking management practices on the part of the Bahamian government, Bahamas National Trust. So I'll just walk you through some of those. This is, this is quite a unique situation that we're in here in the Bahamas, um, where in, in the early 90s, there was actually the peak elasma rank harvest. Um, so that includes shark skates and rays, and it was only 37 metric tons. It's really, it's not that much. I'll touch on that in a second, but this was in 1993, peak elasma rank harvest of 37 metric tons. And later that year, commercial longline gear was banned. So in the same year, you have the peak harvest. And then at the end of that year, there's a ban on the gear type that's, that's, most, that's able to most efficiently capture sharks. Um, so as soon as elasma rank harvest or shark harvest started to pick up, it was basically nixed uh, right in that same year. So as a result of that, if you can't use long lines to catch sharks, then you know, fewer will be caught. So the intended effect was, was there. You see this drop in exports to five, and then three, two, and one metric ton by 1999. And the last export of shark products from the Bahamas happened in 2004. Um, and so that gives us this historical total of just 48 metric tons, according to the UNFAO, that was ever exported from the Bahamas. So to put that in perspective, in the U.S. in 2016, um, over 600 metric tons were harvested, and that's across the U.S., and that doesn't even include the biggest shark fishery, which is for the smooth hound and the Stellis off of the eastern United States. If you include that, it's over 2,000 metric tons in just that one year. So, and that's even with, with the majority of those sharks being harvested sustainably. So to put in perspective, 48 metric tons, although it may seem like a lot, you know, one ton is a thousand kilograms or above 2,000 pounds, 
Um, that's a lot by weight, but in comparison, not much to places even where sustainable shark fishing takes place. Um, so really, all told, there's been very little harvest of sharks in the Bahamas for a very, very long time, and that's a really good thing. And then on top of that, the Bahamas didn't stop there. They, they made the entirety of the Bahamian EEZ a shark sanctuary in 2011. So you can see that means that over 650,000 square kilometers of habitat is protected for sharks. So any sharks anywhere within that white outline there, this shape around the Bahamian EEZ, any sharks in there are protected. Um, the official regulation states that you can't possess fish for, land, sell, export, or import sharks, shark parts, or shark products. So that's really good. Um, basically, the Bahamas have done a great job of looking ahead and protecting sharks well in advance of any intense commercial harvest. Now, that's not the case in other parts of the world. There are parts of the world where sharks and their relatives have been harvested at unsustainable levels. They haven't been afforded that level of management or conservation like they have been here, here at home for us. Um, and so this study in 2014 assessed the risk of extinction to different chondrichthian species around the world. Chondrichthians include shark skates, rays, and chimeras. So that includes elasmobranchs and chimeras, all of the fish that aren't bony fish, the cartilaginous fish. Um, so over a thousand of those species were included in this assessment. And basically, we, we took away two main things from this. One is that we know very little about most of these species, around 50% of all of those cartilaginous fishes were considered data deficient, which means we don't know enough to place them in one of these categories from least concern um, over here on the right, and then all the way to extinct on the far left. And in between these categories, including near threatened, and then the threatened categories of vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered, and then extinct in the wild. So 50% of all these species, we can't even place in one of these categories. And then for the ones that we do place in categories, only 25% of them fall into this category of least concern. And that's, that's not good, right? If, if the group is doing well, it means that cartilaginous fishes have the lowest percent of species in that least concern category of any vertebrate group. They're not in great shape. Um, you know, if we're making big generalizations, not in great shape as a group. 25% um, of chondrichthian fishes were, were assessed to have some level of threat. They were in this vulnerable to critically endangered category. And that's largely due to their shared suite of life history traits that are quite conservative. Um, they have these long gestation periods, they live a long time, have few offspring, and they have a late age of maturity. So really relative to something like a typical bony fish that, that has a ton of offspring, matures quickly, um, and, and doesn't live that long, you know, these animals can't respond to intense fishing pressure rapidly. They can't recover after they've been exploited. Um, they kind of resemble more something like a mammal than they do a bony fish. So that means they can't keep pace with, with some commercial fisheries um, the way that bony fish can. And that contributes to so many of these shark species being listed in a threatened category, about 16% globally fall into one of those threatened categories by the IUCN, according to that 2014 assessment. That's primarily due to three reasons, namely fisheries capture, but also habitat loss and climate change as well. So why do we study sharks? Well, for me, it's largely to inform their management. Um, in some cases, we need to provide the data that's required to restore their populations. In others, it's, it's to just get baseline data before any significant fisheries have developed. And some of the questions that we typically try to answer are how many are there, where are they, and what do they need? Um, we need to figure out what habitats they rely on and link their presence there to those environments. You know, what temperatures do they prefer? Where can we expect to find them? Do they rely on seagrass beds or reef habitats so that we can protect the things that they need to survive and, and flourish, right? So all of these things normally rely on something called CPUE. As we study them, we need to assess um, this, this thing called CPUE that I'll, that I'll mention here. So CPUE stands for catch per unit effort and it comes from an equation. This looks complicated, it's, it's really not complicated. It makes a whole lot of sense. If you have the catch at time t over here on the left, that'll equal catchability over here on the right times effort times the abundance. So what that means is basically you have, you have the catch that you expect 
And that's equal to how catchable something is, right? If something's not catchable, you don't expect to catch a lot of it. Multiplied by how hard you're trying to catch it, multiplied by the actual abundance of that species in a given place. Makes a whole lot of sense. So if you rearrange that equation, then you can get it so that the catch per unit of effort, basically if you divide this equation by effort on both sides, you get catch at times t at time t divided by the effort at times t. And then that's proportional to this catchability coefficient times the number that's actually there. So CPUE is something that we use to give us an indirect measure of abundance. It's an index of relative abundance because it's very difficult, if not impossible, to know how many of one species exists in a given place. You'd have to catch them all um, and make sure none are coming or going. And that's very difficult. People don't do that very often. Um, instead, we use, we use CPUE as a way to look at relative abundance, basically number of sharks per hook per hour of fishing or number of sharks per net per hour of fishing. Again, it's, it's catch per effort. So that's per net or per, per hook um, and how hard you're trying, how long you're trying per hour of fishing or, or hour of observing if you're just looking. Um, so that's catch per unit effort in very general and probably poorly explained sense. But we use that to look at how populations um, might be changing. It's an index of relative abundance. So how do we estimate that for sharks? Um, one way that you're probably very familiar with is that we just catch them, right? Um, we can put out long lines, we can use drum lines, gill nets, um, trawls. There are all kinds of methods you can use to catch sharks and then get them up to the boat and collect all kinds of really valuable data. There's a lot of good data that can come from catching sharks. We can take measurements, right? We can look at things like growth over time, very important for fisheries models. We can tag them. You can see in this photo that white 309 there, that's a dorsal tag. That's great for tagging animals in an area where there are lots of divers, where you can, you can get data from divers about those sharks. Um, then that other, that little, that little yellow um, thing coming out of the side of the muscle there is a, a um, a dart tag, basically. And we can use that to also look at growth rates if you mark and then recapture animals later. Um, you can also get estimates of abundance that way. And then this big thing in the front of the photo, a satellite tag, is really great for looking at depth use and temperature preferences and even horizontal movements over large areas. Um, so you can get a ton of really valuable data from tagging. You can also take a lot of samples. You can take muscle, you can take, uh, you can take fin clips and look at genetic connectivity over big areas of, of ocean. Um, look at where they fit in the food web. A lot of valuable data. Collect parasites, look at sex and maturity, and reproductive state. You know, you can do ultrasounds, see if an animal's pregnant, relate that to where they're going, um, try to find out critical habitats where they might be pupping or mating. So all this stuff, in, in a general sense, relies on catching and, and getting these animals up to the boat to collect these data. Um, so I'll give you an example of where catching sharks can be really useful. We just finished a study that began in the late 1970s with this boat called the Geronimo, this big sailboat. And they set sail with a group of students actually and a couple scientists on board. And they traveled all over the North Atlantic and Western Atlantic. Um, and they did these things called fisheries independent surveys. So they're collecting data independent of commercial fisheries. Um, which is, is really good. It's an independent source of data. And they set long lines in a standardized way all over the place and recorded their catch. And one of the places that they did this was near Luther, really close to where we are right now. And they fished there every year from the late 70s through the 1990s. So we went back in 2011 to 2013 and fished that same way so that we could compare the relative abundance of some shark species over that period to see if it changed between the 70s, 80s, and then 2011 to 2013. And so I'll show you some of those data here. You can see what we're looking at is, is the number of tiger sharks caught per set. So this is a standardized index of relative abundance using CPUE, right? So we have a number of tiger sharks on the y-axis from zero to 10. And then the year on the x-axis down on the bottom from 1979 to 1990 when those historical surveys took place and then from 2011 to 2013, when we went back and surveyed that same site using the same methods. And we kept track of things like temperature and other environmental variables to correct for how those might have changed in between when those surveys took place in the past and ours took place more recently. So we could correct for that in our abundance because maybe sharks, you know, maybe you expect to catch sharks at one temperature and you don't fish that temperature. We have to correct for that to get the, the right CPUE um, index, right? And so what you can see here is tiger sharks were caught between zero and five animals per set 
in the in the 80s, late 70s, late 70s, 80s, even 1990. And then from 2011 to 2013, we caught basically the same number when we fished then. And so this is really interesting data because we can see that, you know, it's not like they were catching a ton of tiger sharks back in the 80s and then that dropped to zero. At the same time, they weren't catching very few and then we caught triple the number um, in 2011 to 2013. Instead, we see this pretty stable um, index of relative abundance. So it's really valuable data that we can get from, from catching animals. The not so good part of catching animals is that it can be quite expensive, very labor intensive, logistically challenging. Obviously, you know, it, it takes a lot of work to go out and set long lines like this. It uses a ton of bait, large teams to get the work done, and you're selective. You're not catching every animal that's out there. You know, the animals are, are picky. They're also size selective. So you might be fishing hooks that only catch big sharks like this tiger shark. Maybe there are tons of tiny sharks around and you, and you miss those if you don't have the right gear type. And on top of that, it's a very stressful process for certain species more than others. So I'm gonna show you this video. This is what a capture process actually looks like on a long line. Um, it's very stressful for certain species, again, more than others. There's, you know, if you think about it, there's the physical trauma of the hook going in the mouth. And then there's a flight or fight response where they freak out. They don't like to be captured, obviously. And there are a lot of physiological changes that happen as a result. You can find that the lactate builds up in the blood, um, oxygen levels go down, carbon dioxide goes up, um, just like you or I would if we suddenly experienced something very stressful. Um, and so I'll show you this video now. So you can see this reef shark, there's a Caribbean reef shark comes up and bites the hook. And you can see its initial escape response here is very dramatic. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't want to be on that hook as you might imagine. It's not a, not a fun experience. Um, the good thing is that we found that a lot of species tend to calm down over time when they're on the long line. And a lot of them are quite resilient to this process. And they actually do exhibit some degree of behavioral and physiological recovery while they're on the line. You'll see that in a second. Now the shark has really calmed down. This is after maybe 15, 20 minutes. And the shark's just cruising around, uh, not too bothered by being captured. So this animal survived. Um, and and post-release mortality and at vessel mortality for a lot of these species is quite low. Um, for others, it, it's, it's higher. So it's definitely something that, that you need to consider when you're picking a method to study sharks or estimate their abundance. So a lot of folks wanted to develop ways that were less invasive. You may, maybe can't collect the same data that you could using long lines um, or by catching animals, but you can still collect some really valuable stuff. And so one thing that, that we've done here is use unbaited video, where we just take a video camera. Here's a GoPro. This is back in like 2013. And we just plop it out there in specific areas and, and see what we find. Very cheap. You don't need any bait. You can look at natural behaviors on a, a broad array of species. There's no attractive properties for predators. But if you're going to drop these somewhere, you want to put them in places where you're going to see something, right? You don't want to just you have to collect the data on the species you're interested in. Um, and so for this study, what we did is we took this GoPro. You can see if you work at a field station, you know what I mean here, but we use anything we possibly can. These are old life jacket straps. Um, so we strapped this GoPro to a cinder block and dropped it in the middle of a creek mouth. You can see on the right there. And the, the sand on either side of the creek mouth is, is the edge of it. So any shark that swims in or out of that creek mouth is gonna be seen by our video camera. So you don't even need bait in that situation. You can just drop the camera there and look at when these sharks enter and exit the creek and get an idea of why they're using the creek um, based on their use of it. Another place we use unbaited videos is out on our fish aggregation devices. My, my friend and colleague, Eric Schneider, has been doing a bunch of work out there looking at how the assemblage changes over time. And so we go out and, and every week for about two years, these cameras went on to the fish aggregation device out in blue water to record what species were there and how that assemblage would change from the time a fad goes into the water many years after. And normally we don't see anything at all, but on occasion, we do see some pretty incredible stuff. Um, not only sharks, but also all kinds of other pelagic fishes. Here are a bunch of jacks surrounded by feeding mahi. Um, to give you an idea, you probably have to watch about 200 hours of video to see something like this, but I, I'm going to spare you those other 199 hours. Um, so you can get some really cool data. And from this, you can look at, you know, how many, how many of this jack species or how many mahi can you catch on camera in the wintertime versus the summertime? You know, stuff like that. Look at seasonality and abundance and presence. Um, there's a lot of good data you can get from this. 
And folks have made it even even better. They've added, you know, as technology has advanced, there are things like these rotating unbated video units where you drop a camera down on a motor. Um, so you can imagine on that video I just showed you, there are tons of fish behind the camera that you're not observing. Um, so there are all kinds of technological ways you can account for that. And this is one where you drop this camera down on a system that spins around the whole time it's recording. So you get a good idea of, of species behind the camera as well. And then of course the brubs, you know, these baited underwater video surveys or, or stations, these are very useful too. Um, some of the first papers that use this technique were in the late 90s where they were completely independent of, of a boat or someone operating it through some kind of wire system. Um, and it's become really popular. It's a great way to get some really valuable data. And it's come a long way as you can see. I love this photo. This is from a study I'll tell you about in a second. Um, in 2007, these are old, these are island school students back then. You can see inside of this underwater housing is a Sony Handycam camcorder. Most people probably don't even remember those, um, but this is pre GoPro, and that's what you needed to do a, a brub set. Um, it's come a long way since then. The cameras are a lot cheaper and easier now. But basically, a, a brub has a few components. You have a bait bag that you use to attract fish. Um, to the to the station and then sometimes you can have an additional you know additional instruments like the current meter here um, and then you basically have a camera housing and you tie a rope to it put a buoy on the top and you drop it down for you know an hour or two hours um, and collect some data on what shows up you can get some really cool data from it one of the things that folks often look for is is a variable called mean count basically when you watch the video you keep an eye out for any target species that you're interested in and then record when they swim by and how many you can see. So this one metric mean count, basically you split that video into a subsample of, of frames. Let's say every 10 seconds you take this video and you, and you chop it up. Every 10 seconds you get a still and you can count the number of given species like this Caribbean reef shark swimming around. You can count the number of reef sharks in each of those stills over the entirety of a brook set, let's say maybe uh, 90 minutes, right? Um, and then you take the average of those counts and that's your mean count. So it gives you, again, this, this CPUE um, index where you can see how many animals are observed per minute or per hour of video observation. And then you can compare between places um, or between seasons and other things. Um, so, so then the other thing that folks often look for is called max n. It's maximum number of individuals of a species observed in a single frame. Um, so here in this video, we're on another kind of similar reef here in Eleuthera. You can see that bait box in the front here, and the camera's recording a nurse shark swimming by. Um, and you can see, you know, there's only there's only one, right? There's one nurse shark swimming by, so your max end for the species for this drop would, would just be one. Other times, you might get, you know, a group of numerous sharks coming by, and, and you would account for that. So there's a lot of good that can come from this. These are great for studying sharks for a number of reasons. Um, there's no stress or mortality associated with this gear type. If you think about studying something like an endangered species of shark array, that's a really good thing. Um, you can, you know, you can also quantify behaviors where if you catch them, you can't actually look at what they're doing. Um, but by observing them without bringing them up to the boat, you can actually look at how their behaviors um, might change in the presence of another predator. You can look at um, competition and aggression. You can also look at how they influence the behavior of prey species that might show up in the frame as well. And there are examples of that in the literature. Um, on top of that, you can drop them pretty much anywhere. You can drop them in the deep sea. You can put them in places where um, fishing gear would get stuck, like really complicated coral reef habitats um, or rocky bottom. And they're also not as selective as fishing gear. So you can see all manner of sizes and species that you might be missing if you're fishing uh, with a certain gear type. At the same time, you're not collecting all the data that you can from catching sharks. You, you can't tag them. You're not taking any samples. Um, you can actually look at individuals for species that have unique identifiers for some, some race species. Folks have done this looking at the pattern of spots on their back. Um, but generally, you can't look at tagging or, or take samples. Um, you also have a harder time getting size estimates. You can still do it, um, but it's not done as commonly as, as you would obviously get if you caught animals. And the last thing I'll mention is that they can undercount, right? So like you saw in, in those past videos, like the mahi, you know, there are lots of fish behind you, and at high densities, you might be missing a lot of the animals that are there, but you're just not seeing. So you can undercount 
relative abundance at, at high densities. So there's one study here that was done in 2011 by Ed Brooks and, and colleagues that looked at validating the use of baited remote underwater video surveys of rugs for assessing diversity, distribution, and abundance of sharks in the Bahamas. Um, and so this is really cool. So those are three things that you can get from using grubs, diversity, distribution, abundance, and I'll touch on each of those briefly. So first of all, for relative abundance and distribution, um, I'll show you some data from that paper. You can see here on the y-axis, you've got the mean long line CPUE. So what these guys did is they set long lines and then they set grubs and they compared estimates of abundance between these two types of gear. They said, you know, can grubs answer questions as well as long lines, these specific questions. Um, and so here, what I'm showing you is mean long line CPU catch per unit effort in sharks per hook per hour of fishing. And at the top in, in panel A, you can see the CPU at three different sites, basically WZ, the wall zone, and then the middle bank zone and the bank zone. So from going left to right, you're basically getting shallower. So from these long line data, you can see, well, the relative abundance of Caribbean reef sharks is higher at the wall than it is at either of these two habitat types. And then at the bottom, panel C there, you can do the same thing. And you can look across habitat types, types at different seasons. You can see that the sharks are most abundant. You're seeing, you're catching more sharks in the summer than you do at any of these other three seasons. Um, so that's really valuable data. So they looked and they said, well, can we get that from Brooks? dropping video units, we, we see the same trends. And so here I'm showing you the mean grub CPUE. This is sharks observed per hour of video. And again, on the y-axis, you've got CPUE there. And on the x-axis at the top panel, panel B, you've got again from shallow to deep, from the wall zone to the banks. And you see the same pattern. You see that the grubs are showing the exact same data that the, that the long lines are showing, that the sharks are more abundant along the wall than they are elsewhere. And again, at the bottom in panel D, you can see the same thing there, more sharks in the summer than in the other seasons. And so this was a cool paper because they looked at the relative abundance and distribution of sharks using these two habitat types deployed in the same places in the same way. And they compared and they said, well, you know, grubs are, we, we can validate grubs in this manner. This was back when uh, there was still a lot of work that needed to be done to see how these grubs compare to long lines and other more commonly used techniques. They found well, they're, they're quite comparable. It's a useful way to address these questions. And then I'm going to show you some of the stuff we've done in the deep ocean. This is some really some cool footage that we have um, looking at the diversity of organisms that are down deep in places that we haven't studied very well. And also their distribution, basically. And we see what depths these animals occur at um, using baited video units. And so I'll show you some clips that, that show some of these animals in a second. But to do this, um, what we did was basically drop these baited video units off of the wall. So what you can see here is Cape Eleuthera there, highlighted in yellow. And then those, those really kind of pretty colors there are the edge of the wall, the edge of Exuma Sound. And orange is about 50 meters. And there's this gradient from orange down to green. Green is about 800 plus meters. You can see it drops off really, really fast. And one of the amazing things about grubs that I mentioned earlier is that you can put them in places that, that you'll lose long line gear or use, lose fishing gear. Um, and this whole yellow area here on this, this image is an area where you're gonna lose fishing gear. You're trying to sample sharks down at you know, 50 to 500 meters. It's gonna be very difficult because it's very rocky and you're not gonna get all that gear back. The dropping grubs is a great way to assess how the distribution and abundance, relative abundance of different species changes with depth. And so that's one of the things that we've been doing over the past few years. So I'll show you some video here. Uh, this is from an expedition in 18, looking at deep sea fishes along the wall. So you can see at 130 meters, there are these blackfin snapper cruising around. This is right on the edge of the wall. We stuck this bait box into a little pocket and that, that light is coming from a sub that's looking back at the camera that was just deployed. You can see there are still these reef fish hanging out. There's a yellowtail snapper and these blackfin snapper. And there's still some light in that clip. We drop down to 230 meters or so, and there's a different species of snapper now. We didn't see any of those shallower species. Instead, there's what looks to be a silk snapper here cruising around. A little deeper, a little deeper drop. You notice there's almost no light here at all. It's very dark. And we have a, a, a new species show up at this depth that wasn't at the previous two. It's an Atlantic six gill. 
and you can see he's really interested in the bait. Um, very cool shark. Uh, it actually has six gills instead of five. I'll show you another another species that has six instead of five in a second. Um, and also some eels, some eels that I still have not identified. Um, I have no idea what species of eel that is that lives at that depth here in England Sound. Um, and I'll mention that you know a lot of these things that we see on video we've never actually caught before. Like we we haven't caught that species of eel in traps or on long lines. So it's it's a different type of data that you get. And then here's some behavior. You can see this Atlantic six gill just got scared by the by this giant misty grouper. So that's pretty cool. You know, we think of sharks as the, the apex predator all the time. That's really not the case um, in many circumstances. And so all of the videos that I'm showing you right now have white lights, um, which is nice because you can you can pick up color, but it's intrusive. So these animals don't like it. But this is one that we dropped to look at feeding behavior. In deep sea sharks. You can see this jack that we're using as bait and this little Cuban dogfish, very cute shark, is, is the most abundant species of shark between about um, maybe 450 and 800 meters deep in England Sound. Um, that's, that's full grown, that's not a, a juvenile, that's, that's an adult. Um, very cool species of deep water dogfish and you can see how he comes in and feeds by using his top jaw to grab on and then the bottom jaw is like a saw. So he shakes his whole body back and forth and that bottom jaw carves out tissue from, from those prey species. Um, so really, really cool shark. Um, and then I'll show you just a couple other highlights here. Some other stuff you'd never know from, from fishing. Here's a, here's a night shark again. We never caught night sharks. But we know they're here from video. And he just ate a Cuban dogfish. Um, very cool. I, I'd love to catch some of these really cool sharks we don't know a whole lot about. Uh, but they live down at these depths. Now he's going to steal our entire bait box. And that would be the, the end of the brub drop for that one. Uh, he actually, first he, he ate a little ice pod there. You might notice the eyelid flipping up. So this is a carcariniform shark. It's a requiem shark. Um, and so it's got this nictitating membrane that flips up to protect the eye. So there he goes. He's a big nail. You can see those claspers under the pelvic fins. He takes our bait box and, and off he goes. Uh, very nice. Um, and some other clips here, some, you know, you can see things like invertebrates. Again, just driving home the point that this is less selective than a lot of fishing gears. You can see things that otherwise you would miss if just fishing. Um, and there's an eel here that's going to pop up. Again, this is, if anybody watching this or whoever watches this knows what kind of species that is, I would love to know. Um, we still have not identified this species of eel, but he's down quite deep around 500 meters. Um, and he showed up and, and hung around the bait for a bit. Still don't know what that is. Um, and then the last clip I want to show you from this is, is an Atlantic six foot again, but this one has a hook in his mouth. Um, so, you know, even though we're down deep, these animals are not free from fishing pressures. You can see that that, that animal's down. He's, he's never going shallower than maybe 400 meters or so, but um, still exposed to the pressure of, of fishing as well. And we have some fancier ways of, of getting video as well. This is, this is also a brub that we have here at CEI, but it's a very fancy one. Um, so at the top there, all this yellow is called syntactic foam. It's made of little glass spheres that are rated to about 2,000 meters, and it provides flotation to bring this thing back up to the surface. You just drop it and it floats up when you, when you tell it to. Um, and then these little green things with a bunch of light bulbs in there. Those are potted LEDs and that's red light. And the red LEDs are invisible to deep sea critters. Um, so this is far less intrusive than the rub videos I've showed you previously. Um, and so this camera in the middle here is, is a really good camera. It shoots in black and white. And then in the front of this, there would be a bait arm. Um, and on the back end, you can attach all kinds of instruments to collect data on temperature and depth and salinity as well. So you can get a lot of data from this thing. It's called a Medusa. Um, it's a fancy, fancy bro. So I'll show you some of the video clips that we've collected from this. This is, this is not my work. This is Mackie and, and Ollie and, and Ed long ago, um, around 2013 or so. And so you can see this shark is really not concerned by the presence of the Medusa, again, because of these red lights. Um, but here's the bait box. There's a giant isopod on the front of it. And this blunt nose six gill comes in. You can count those gill slits. There's six gill slits as opposed to five, similar to the Atlantic six gill, except that that shark gets to about five meters long. It's the biggest predator down there. 
Um, then those are some eels, and this is another species of false cat shark, Pseudotrachus microdon, um, down really, really deep, very slow moving, really cool. So there's all these different species of sharks that we've seen down there, isopods and invertebrates like these shrimps um, that we haven't caught before and, and really know very little about. So you can get some really cool data from these, these more sophisticated brubs that you drop down deep and, and that aren't intrusive. And you get more natural behaviors and you don't scare things away. Hear more of those isopods and then of course uh, some kind of squid. I'm not entirely sure what kind of squid that is. It's not a giant squid, but it's a a large squid. It's the only one we've seen in Exuma Sound, and again, we've never caught one of those either. Um, so it's really cool. You know, stuff like this opens up a lot of avenues for future research based on the observations that we get. So BRUBS are great. BRUBS are, again, Beta Remote Underwater Video Surveys is what it stands for. You can get relative abundance indices through CPUEs, catch pre unit effort that we talked about. Uh, you can address distribution, look at vertical distribution um, in the water column at different depths, down deep, shallow. Um, also, horizontal distribution or distribution across habitats, like I showed you from the, the shallower survey that we did looking from the wall zone to the banks. Um, and then, of course, diversity as well. You can, you can get a measurement of diversity at all of these different habitats for a range of species. So, brubs are really, really cool. You can get some cool data from, from using them. Um, so, I just want to wrap it up there and I'll acknowledge some folks that really did a whole lot of work for this. I actually don't use brubs all that often, mostly uh, use long lines for the work that I've been doing. Um, Duncan, you mentioned the silky sharks. For the silkies, you know, you got to catch them to put tags on them to track their movements, and that's one of the main things I'm doing. But these folks did a ton of work, um, and Ollie Shipley as well, and, and Owen O'Shea and others, um, and about brubs. A lot of folks who have, who have done work using brubs, especially down deep here in Exhibit Sound. Um, so with that, thank you very much. I will. Uh, unshare my screen and pass it back over to Duncan. Cool, all right, let me see. I'm just trying to uh, see if I'm gonna pop back up. There we go. I think Brendan's got the screen right now. There we go. All righty, thanks so much, buddy. I uh, actually learned a few things there. It's actually nice to uh, see, especially being involved in some of these shoots and everything. You hear a lot about the work that goes on, but it's actually nice to actually see some of the uh, footage myself. Uh, pretty cool images, especially the deep stuff. That, that's really, really cool. I'm definitely into that. Yeah. So uh, let me see. We've got some questions for you. So I hope you're ready. <laughs> I'm good. Okay, first of all, nice easy one uh, from Hannah. Uh, I think it was Hannah. Uh, yep. What's your favorite shark and why? Oh, that's a great question. That's like, uh, you know, it's a good question, but it's a hard one to answer. Um, it's changed a lot. Right now, it's the soapy because. Um, because I spend a lot of my life thinking about studies, and so um, it makes sense they'd be my favorite. Um, we're doing a lot of work on them. They're in urgent need of, of information to improve their management, um, so I'm very motivated to study them. At the same time, they're very curious in, a, in what is to me a very non-threatening way. You know, I love getting in the water with silky sharks because they're so curious, they hang out, um, and I've never, I've never felt uncomfortable with them even though they're, they come right up to you. Um, they're very cute, they're a lot of fun to work with. They're a very classic body shape of a shark out in the open ocean. Um, yeah, there's just, there's a lot to love about them. Oh yeah, no, I definitely, uh, I'm a big fan of the silky sharks. Uh, they're, they're definitely quite inquisitive and, and uh, yeah, I've had a, a few amazing experiences working with them, especially uh, filming them at night. That was quite, quite uh, an interesting, experience because they're they're very tactile being pelagic predators so i um, had these tiny little sharks and right out there in the middle of the night they'd come and they just start rubbing up against me and uh, i think they were just trying to figure out what i was in the water but as you can imagine over thousands of feet of water in pitch black it probably gives you a little bit of goosebumps when something touches you so yeah uh, amazing little, little <laughs> that, yeah, uh, for sure. um, sounds a little uncomfortable yeah definitely <laughs> Uh, we have a question from Bob Sluka. Have you compared brub surveys to in-water visual surveys? Uh, we haven't done any of that work here, but folks have, have thought about that question. Um, again, with all of these methods, there, there are benefits and, and there are drawbacks, right? And so for underwater visual surveys, there's a lot of bias as well. Um, because a lot of sharks don't want to be in the same place as humans. 
Um, and so for underwater visual census data, um, it's generally biased towards zero, right? Because a lot of sharks swim away from divers that are, that are getting those counts. Um, so grubs are, I would argue, a, a bit more efficient because they attract sharks to the camera. You don't have to swim by to look for them. Um, it's a lot easier. You don't need to be on scuba. You just drop the thing down and pull it back up. Um, and at the same time, it, it doesn't undercount the way that visual census does. Yeah, I think uh, especially what I've seen is, is whenever I'm in the water with sharks, they tend to um, definitely see me as another predator in the water. So they're always going to take that into consideration as they're always going to be quite cautious of having that other big body, especially my big body in the water pushing around the camera. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely think there is, uh, there is an effect of having a human being in the water and why brubs are actually so effective of, of, at, at doing their job. Cool. James from the UK uh, has asked, is there, is like you talked about a little bit about shark fishing at the, at the beginning, is any shark fishing sustainable? Is there any species that like we can harvest and eat in your opinion? Yeah, definitely. There are. Um, there are. And, and a great place to look for examples of that is, is in the United States where there are sustainable shark fisheries. So any, any fishery can be sustainable if the harvest is at the appropriate level, right? So even if there's a species that, um, you know, that barely ever reproduces, that matures really late, maybe a sustainable harvest would be one animal per year in a given place, right? That would be a sustainable fishery, as long as you're not having a, a detrimental impact on the population that's, that's working faster than they can replenish, right? Um, so there are sustainable shark fisheries. A good place to look for them, for example, is in the United States, things like black tips um, and, and some dog fishes as well. So it is possible, yeah. But you have to be very careful, far more so than you do for bony fish, uh, which, which have different life histories and, and you don't have to fish them at such low levels. And something I'll, I'll just, one last point is, we've been doing some, some work on marine mammal bycatch recently and it's, it's, a mad, it's, it's incredible to go from thinking about sharks, right? And even saying something like 48 metric tons of sharks isn't that much relative to another place. That thought in the concept of something like a marine mammal that has a far more conservative life history than a shark is insane, right? So for marine mammals in the US, there are stocks where the limit for how many can be killed by fisheries in a year on accident, right? They're protected, but on accident is on the order of one or two animals. Um, and so all of these things, you have to think about it in terms of their life history and what those populations are able to withstand. And that differs not only by group, but also by individual species. And there's incredible diversity within sharks as a massive group of over 500 species. Um, and they, they respond differently to fisheries pressures. Some of them are far more sensitive than others. Yeah, very good. Very good thinking points right there. Um, let me see. Uh, what have we got? We've got from Tiffany Stewart um, and also from Jorge, uh, which kind of brings it on to Jorge's question, which is uh, Tigo was wondering, um, from Tiffany Stewart, Tigo was wondering how you first got into researching sharks. And then also Jorge was asking, do you um, do, you do internships? Like uh, they, they seem like a similar sort of questioning path. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we, we do have internships. Uh, right now, we do not for the fall. Obviously, things are very different this year than they have been in years past, but hopefully the internship program gets going again. Um, I actually see in the chat a couple folks you can chat to about the internship program. Candice Fields and Gina Batlowski both came through as interns here. Um, I came through as an intern here actually in 2012, and, and I keep coming back. Um, so yeah, it's a great intern internship program and definitely check it out on our website. Hopefully it's running again in the spring. Um, how did I get into researching sharks? Um, you know, I don't have some kind of life changing story about it. I grew up along, well, I grew up in Kentucky, but, but my mom moved to Florida when I was a kid. And so I spent a lot of summers literally on a fishing pier for 12 hours a day. Um, and it just got me interested in in fishing and in the ocean and I, I did a lot of kayaking and snorkeling. Um, my mom got me really interested in 
just the natural world. Um, and so eventually that evolved into a fascination with biology and wildlife management. And, um, you know, that coupled with a love for swimming and being on the ocean. And then a need that I saw for research um, on, this, on this group of species that was, was being exploited at unsustainable levels in many places uh, motivated me to focus in on sharks. And so that's, that's what I've been doing ever since. Cool. Very, very cool. And yeah, as everybody's from different backgrounds when they uh, follow their career paths. But I think the biggest thing to kind of take note is definitely find experience. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's exactly in the field that you want to be in, but something comparative. Um, whether it's in animal care or animal research um, or being in the field, learning different skills that will help you along the way on boats, in the water, swimming, diving, uh, anything like that can help you on the towards stepping stones to achieving a goal. Uh, let me see. Um, Tiffany Stewart. Yeah, that was from Tiffany Stewart. I was going to go back to Bob Sluka, who thank you very much for ask, answering the question about the bros, but he was wondering if, uh, if you do them differently for rays. I wonder if that's because they kind of sit on the bottom a little bit. Um, I know people people use brub sets um, to look at the relative abundance distribution and diversity of rays as well, um, and they don't do anything differently. So I'm I'm sure if you were looking at a specific species of ray, maybe you'd, um, you know you'd want to set it at a certain depth or a certain habitat, something like that. Um, but the brub itself would be would be the same. Um, and so there's a huge project that's been going on for a while called Global Finprint. Um, run through researchers all over the world and some of the PIs are at FIU. And a couple of the videos I showed you are actually real rough sets that went towards FinPrint. And I know that they just released a big paper looking at relative abundance of sharks all over the world, reef sharks all over the world. And, um, and some of that work was done here as well and in the Bahamas, but they're also gonna be looking at stingrays. Um, so yeah, you can, you can get a lot of data on, on numerous species, not only sharks, from the same method. Um, Hannah was wondering whether sharks are afraid of the brubs or the cameras. Um, not in my experience. Duncan, you're in the water with sharks and cameras more. I, I find they're quite curious. What do you think? Uh, yeah, a lot of the times the sharks are fairly curious. They've, they're always working from that, that sensory cue of the smell and the scent of the bait. So they're coming in. Um, and using that, that sense to actually home in on the target. And when they turn up, they find this thing. A lot of the times these cameras, even though we can't detect it, are giving off a tiny little signal, uh, whether it's like an electrical signal or it's like anything, like even a tiny little hum or a flash or a beep, uh, that that shark is, is hearing um, and picking up through its other senses, um, which makes it naturally curious of the camera and the brub. Uh, even some of the, the frames, of these brubs, uh, metal frames, and the way that that metal reacts with the salt water it's in can even affect how those sharks are sensing that bit of bit of, uh, bit of kit. So what's quite interesting is obviously they're honing in going, okay, that smells like food, and then they're getting all these weird other senses uh, that are getting hit. So I think uh, they're, they're, they're not really, not really scared of it. Um, I think they might be cautious a little bit because it's unfamiliar, but penultimately, um, they, they are associating it with food. So that's kind of what they end up coming in uh, to try and get at the end of the day. So no, I don't think so. Um, let me see. Oh, this is, was quite an interesting question from M. Fernandez. Does the mortality caused by scientific sampling, sampling in your opinion, have a negative effect on populations of sharks? Um, in, in my opinion, no, it's, um, you know, when folks are out doing research on these species, we're not using the same techniques as commercial fishermen. So for instance, if I go out and set a long line for my research, um, which we have a permit to do in the Bahamas, then we don't set miles and miles of hooks. We're not setting hundreds of hooks and we don't leave those hooks for more than a couple of hours. We, we do our very best to minimize mortality. Um, and so it's very different. The scientific long lining process looks very different than the commercial long lining process. Mortality is far, far lower. Um, at the same time, if you're researching an endangered species, something that you're really, really worried about getting stressed out on a line and, and maybe dying, you probably, 
you know, you might not use a long line. You might use something like a drum line or some, some less invasive method where the stress is a bit reduced. Um, and so, yeah, I would say it's, it's a very, very different scenario. And, and in the process of doing research, there are certainly mortalities. There are animals that, that die as a result. Um, but they're far outweighed by the population level benefits that come from doing this research for, for species that in some cases are, are quite endangered. Yeah, for sure. And that's the thing, like uh, a lot of times we get questioned about why uh, scientists have to catch and tag these animals, why can't they leave them be? And the biggest thing is that without uh, having the scientific data to back up um, the arguments and the reasons for conserving these animals, then you're not going to be able to uh, enact decisions and make uh, and have governments and, and countries actually um, be convinced to protect these animals and these ecosystems. So um, it's it's something that has to be done in order for us to protect the uh, species as a whole. Uh, but yeah, definitely great question. All right, we've got time for a couple le uh, couple more, and then uh, we'll have to jump. Um, okay, Carly was uh, oh this. It's very species dependent, but Carly was wondering how many teeth do sharks lose? Uh, to be perfectly honest, I, I don't know. It's it's a very big number in yeah, hundreds, yeah. Um, but it does depend on the species. It depends on on how fast they grow um, and their metabolic rate. Obviously, what temperatures they're hanging out at, how fastly they can replace or grow, grow tissue. Um, and also what they're eating, right? So species that are eating very hard things um, are going to lose more teeth than, you know, if you have a species that's primarily eating, uh, just swallowing fish whole, you know, it might not lose teeth nearly as frequently as something that's biting down on a turtle shell, right? So um, short answer, I don't know, uh, but that's a great question. Yeah, like, uh, that's the thing. Sharks never have to go to the dentist because their teeth are completely getting replaced all the time. So yeah, it's, 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 it's probably a, a very, very high number um, and hard to actually figure out. But as Brendan was saying, it's very species specific. And, and some sharks, like for example, the cookie cutter that has those terrifying jaws, uh, they, they lose one entire jaw at a time. The entire set of teeth just drop out at once. So um, yeah, it's very species specific. But uh, <laughs> in a nutshell, the answer is probably lots, I guess, lots and lots of teeth. Okay, probably the last question I'm going to do from uh, Bukta in Wyoming that we had earlier is um, obviously technology is advancing over the years um, and then obviously the change in cameras um, is what was said. So how do you account um, as you're doing research over the years with these bruvs on the change in technology? How do you standardize that? That's pretty tricky, I imagine. No, I don't know. I guess I guess one answer would be that no matter what the, you know, whether you're watching video that's 1080p or 4K, if you see a shark in the frame at either of those resolutions, you still know it's a shark, right? And, and your ability to ID it is probably quite similar. Um, and so the cool thing about rubs or long lines is you do your best to collect all the data that you need to standardize the survey method. And so like this big project I mentioned, Global Finprint, you know, when they drop a camera with bait in front of it, they don't just drop it and, and collect the data on how many sharks swim by it. They also look at temperature, they record the habitat type, they record obviously the number of minutes that are recorded. Um, I showed you that one photo of a bruv that I actually recorded the current, right? They recorded current at the site. So you try to account for all these things mathematically in your estimates of relative abundance at different sites. So you're accounting for things that you're not um, manipulating, but, but do vary as you're doing your study. And so if all of those data are collected and you have a survey maybe in 2011 and one in 2020, and one is at a low resolution and one's a bit higher, um, you know, you can, you can reasonably compare the data using catch per unit effort from those two video cameras. Um, as long as enough is accounted for, I would say. So it's not a huge issue. Um, and I don't think that's actually been done yet where, where folks have compared across years using rubs, many years where there would be a huge technological difference. Instead, at this point, rubs are mostly used to compare between um, within smaller time frames. I would say. Yeah, I think, I think one of the biggest things with technology, like Brandon was saying, was um, 
as the resolution has got much higher, where um, um, that really has zero uh, interference with with what we're doing, because obviously it's the same same size of image. But uh, one of the things that really uh, needs to be standardized with drugs as as they progress is the field of view of the camera. So you always want to make sure you're using the same angle and field of view of the camera. So whether you have 140 five degree field of view, like a wide angle, which then with the diffraction on the water gets reduced slightly. As long as that's standardized every time with every camera generation, regardless of the resolution and high, how high quality is, um, it should be it should be very comparative year after year. And and if, if you look into Brugs as well, they do standardize a lot of things like the time, uh, the amount of bait you um, a species of, of bait used as well at different locations. So um, a lot of that is standardized so that they can look back and do comparative stuff over the years. Cool. All right. So um, got a few thank yous from people like Bob and stuff, but we're just going to wrap up right now. Uh, for anybody who's interested in uh, Brennan's work, uh, check out some of the work that uh, CI and um, on Instagram, where can they find you guys work-wise? Um, CIBahamas.org is, is the best place to go. Um, I okay, think we also cool. have an Instagram and Facebook as well. But yeah, the website's got it all. Perfect. And when the world gets back to normal, if uh, any of you guys are keen on doing internships, learning a little bit more about uh, the oceans and the work, as well as working with some of the fantastic sharks that they have out in Eleuthera and CEI, get onto the Cape Eleuthera Institute website uh, and check out the work that they're doing there and at the Island School. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks again very much for your time, Brendan. If anybody missed part of this presentation or they want somebody that they know to watch it, um, keep an eye on our YouTube page and it'll be up there along with all the previous presentations that we've had from our amazing Sharky heroes around the world. Perfect. Awesome. All right. I'm going to stop the recording now.